everybody, I'm Jana, and thanks for joining me for another episode of Across the Board, a show where we talk about board games that are eco-friendly with publishers, designers, and gamers. In today's episode, I had the opportunity to sit down and chat with Lori Blake, the designer of Earth Rising, which is coming out on Kickstarter August 24th. It's published by Stop, Drop, and Roll Games. This game is themed around the idea of saving the world from climate change in 20 years. It's also being produced in a highly sustainable manner. Now on his website, he explains that the game was 100% sustainably produced. Now this is very different than something being 100% sustainable. So please listen carefully to this conversation. Let me know what you think and what your feedback is on this topic and please enjoy. So I am really curious about this theme. Why 20 years? Like, where does that number come from? Well, it comes from a couple of things. So um, first of all, uh, the origin of Earth Rising is that um, I was inspired when I went to see a documentary called 2040. Um, mm -hmm. And that was all about the idea of, uh, you know, the, the climate crisis is is clearly happening. The vast majority of the world is is in agreement that that is is a is a fact. Yeah. Is there anything we can do about it? Is it already too late? What if we can do something about it? What is that? And um, it was a fascinating film because it was the first thing that gave me hope on the climate crisis. Hmm. Um, Everything else, you know, with the Extinction Rebellion and with all of the protests and with all of the sort of scientific people talking about how much worse it's going to get and how much quickly it's going to get worse, all of that was very down. It was very difficult to engage with because of how hopeless it all felt. But right. 2040 gave me the feeling of, you know, the fact that we we can do this. This is something that's possible. There, there doesn't need to be any science fiction solutions. We mm. don't need to suddenly invent something to make this better. We aren't relying upon, um, you know, anything that is an unknown. Everything, all the tools that we need to fix the climate crisis and to make our world better, not just for the planet, but also for ourselves, are all present and existing. Oh, wow. Yeah, and that's it was, awesome. Yeah, it was, it was revolutionary for me. From what I understand, I, I read a little bit about the inspiration and it involves the donut system. What? Yeah. What is that? Is that part of the documentary or is that another tangent? So it was featured in the documentary oh, okay. and uh, it's effectively donut economics, um, mm -hmm. which is about the idea that you have uh, a society is represented in the form of a donut um, and you have like this outer ring um, and then everything outside of that ring is how much the environment can take and everything inside of that ring is how much the society is failing to provide for uh, its people. So Aww. people in poverty go into the center of it, people, and the amount of strain and, and difficulty that our society is placing on the planet goes on the outside of it. And what we want is to shrink the inside whilst at the same time lowering the amount that it's encroaching on how much the natural world can take. That is effectively how Earth Rising works. So we want to turn the donut into a pancake. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Exactly. Okay. I love the food analogies. <laughs> <laughs> it helps a lot of people. Okay, okay. That's really cool. You explained it brilliantly. What about that theory? What about that idea inspired you? Was it the visual aspect or how it all works together? Like, what happened when you heard that theory? I mean, I'll be honest, I put together the core aspects of the game within about four hours of seeing the film. Um, <laughs> like uh, well, I've, I've mentioned before that I'm, I'm on the autistic spectrum and uh, I have ADHD. And so when I have a idea in my head that I feel the need to focus on, mm -hmm. I am completely focused on it. It is 100%. There is nothing else in this world but what I am currently focused on. Right. Um, <laughs> And so, uh, yeah, basically I came away from this film was just like, wow, this is, this is so, so much and so good. And it just kind of all clicked into place. And I got this really clear vision of how it should look. And I have, in fact, since we are on a video, yeah. brought along the original sketch. <gasps> 
That's the um, original. That was in the four hours. That was the four hours. That's what I what I put together, oh, wow. and it looks pretty much the same. If anyone goes and checks out Earth Rising's uh, thing, it really hasn't changed too much. Um, it's you know it's it's got all those segments. Of, of, you know it's got all these segments that are yeah. that get, are connected to the inner and outer parts, and they they flip into the middle when they can when they're sort of free of strain, and that allows us to provide more space for people. Um, gotcha. And it got refined as a game. It got it got heavily worked to make it as fun as possible. Um, you know, ultimately, I'm a game designer first, not an educator. I didn't know, I didn't know most of what I know now, hmm. which means that while working on Earth Rising, which was about a year and a half's worth of sort of research and and design, um, you know, I was as much working at how it worked as as sort of. I suppose anyone who would be playing the game would be. Where did you get your start in game design? Is this one of your first designs? You speak to any any game designer and ask them if it's their first design, and they will normally say, while this may well be my first published design, it is built on the backs of 100,000 other ideas that have been built and workshopped and messed with and everything else. And I, gotcha. you know, game design is very much a craft. Um, and, uh, you know, there are... I guess I've got about five other games that have been made and finished and worked on. Gotcha. Um, and it's it's not our first game as a company. We we originally uh, released Pugs and Mugs in 2019. It's adorable. Uh, I've seen the pictures of that. It's brilliant, and and that isn't. I didn't design that game. I I developed it. Uh, okay. But nonetheless, it's. Well, I've that's from been... Stop, Drop, and Roll as well. That was your your first published game. Okay. That's it. In sort of early 2018, we were putting together the ideas of of starting a company, and then it got to 2019. We were like, "Cool, yeah, this is going really well." Um, and then the pandemic hit, mm. so we kind of had to uh, we kind of had to decide pretty early on: Are we going to go ahead with this? Still, we've got everything prepped. We're sort of ready to go. We're going to make it happen for our first ever time in the midst of a pandemic, or are we going to delay it in the hopes mm. that it will get better? Um, and we kind of decided that, well, at the very least, if we're going to learn the hard way, then we're going to learn a lot quicker. So we went for it. And it was a success, and it's awesome, and Pugs and Mugs has been a delight, and loads of people love it, and that's great. That's um, awesome. So this will be my first game that I've designed purely myself with the team. Um, and yeah, I, I'm so excited to get it out. We've had loads of fantastic feedback. and. It's been great. So catching us back up to today with your um, with your design of Earth Rising, what are the mechanics that players are going to be dealing with in the game to save the world in 20 years? The base mechanics really are about, um, it's a cooperative game. I should probably start off by mentioning that. Okay. It is completely cooperative. Gotcha. Um, and cooperation is a vital part of playing it at all times. Um, you have you draw influence cards every turn uh, and these influence cards directly relate to counters that are on the board um, and they're your influence over certain sectors so there are six sectors around the board and these are agriculture industry um, culture infrastructure politics and energy hmm. and these are all the things that people need to be able to live a you know modern life um as you know in in society and without these things in some way people will be um reduced to effectively poverty lifestyles so no power no access to goods no food any of these things and you know people are going to be in serious trouble in mm. modern society um so the influence cards that you get are effectively your means of affecting the tokens on the board if it's an influence card that matches the sector you're playing, so let's say you're playing the energy character, the climatologist, um, if you have an energy card, you're able to affect your tokens for one card. If you're trying to affect someone else's sector, you need two of that, that sector's type. Okay. What that means is that, let's say you have drawn an energy card, a politics card, and an agriculture card. Okay, that's fine. Um, you know, you can use your energy cards, but you've still got four actions. You've still got three actions left after you've used that. 
you could then give your politics card to the politics player, which means on their turn, they'll be able to use it for one rather than you having to wait until you get a politics card in order to be able to use it yourself. So it's very much a game of giving things to each other, helping each other out with what you need to be able to do things both quickly as possible and in a way that uh, is efficient. On top of that, um, the way the practices relate to the board is that if they're an unsustainable practice, they put a point of strain on our planet. So mm -hmm. the, the ecological burdens that are along the outside, but at the same time, they support people. So regardless of whether they're sustainable or unsustainable, they support people in our society. So we need these practices in order to live. If you just take them off because they're unsustainable, people will be forced back into poverty. But if you, um, if you just leave them there, then they're going to be doing damage to the environment. Mm. So it's a balancing act of trying to transform our practices we rely on into sustainable ones without mm without basically making problems for the people who are trying to live in this society. That sounds really interesting. <laughs> and from what I understand, you can actually, you do you ha currently have it free on your website to play virtually? Yep. That's right, right? yes. Yeah. So okay. it's so available on screen. Do that? Uh, either on screen top or on um, tables of simulator. Okay. So um, ScreenTop is completely browser-based and free. You don't need a login or anything. You can literally just drop the link to someone else and they can just join a seat. It's that oh, simple. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we think that's fantastic for accessibility. So since you don't need to own a copy of it, you can just play it. Yeah. Um, but so obviously, cool. lots of people have Tabletop Simulator, so we made it available there too. When you decided you wanted to do a board game about saving the world and you didn't just want to make it thematically about saving the world, but you also wanted to make it environmentally friendly. Where did you start with that process? People looking at board games from an ecological basis is, it's kind of exploded over the last, I don't know, six months or so. Um, mm -hmm. When we were first starting to look at um, board, how to produce a board game ecologically, uh, the only ones that we could find that had really done it were um, games like photosynthesis. Um, and even then that was only to a degree. Right. Um, and the truth is that until very recently, there weren't that many suppliers or manufacturers that were able to produce in that way. Um, they are starting to hear game producers voices mm -hmm. and are offering more and more ecologically friendly methods, but you do still have to ask for them. They won't offer them because mm. they're a few pence more expensive. The truth is, is that it's quite difficult to understand what actually goes into, like what, what materials are used in the production of a board game, because it's like, okay, well, it's got cardboard, but what's the ink made of? What's the, um, what's the laminate made of? What is the, uh, you know, the UV spotting that's on your box that makes it really fancy and stand out? What's, what's that made of? What's that varnish? It's one of those things of the more you kind of have to try and find out, um, the more difficult it is to get straight answers. Um, mm. And thankfully, we have all those now. You know, it, as I say, all the manufacturers are getting much better at it. Um, and generally, you know, we've, we've been through conversations with about five or six different manufacturers. Um, really? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> And a lot of them are in China, but there are there are some that do limited um, limited sustainable production in um, I think it's Vienna. Unfortunately, they weren't at the right they they weren't sustainable enough that we felt it was more important than the distance it would travel. So, for example, a lot of people say, "Well, a game is only sustainable to such a degree if it's made in China because it has so far to travel." But on the other hand of it. If your game is going to travel that distance, uh, but is made of products that are going to, in the long term, end up in a landfill and stay there for 300 years, long term, what has caused more damage? Is it the use of fuel to get it across the world through one trip? Or is it the plastic components that have been rotting in a landfill and causing chemical degradation? When we looked into it, we kind of felt that the leaching of plastic into our earth and the creation of toxic chemicals that are used in the production of them in the first place, we felt it was more important that our game, no matter what happens to it after it's been made, will not be a burden on our planet. 
there is no doubt that the logistics system of our entire planet and everything that we rely on to ship goods from across the world needs massive transformation but that's not going to change whether or not we're shipping it from europe to america or whether it, we're shipping it from china to europe so ultimately it's damage done either way so that was the decision we ended up making on your website you say that you your board game is a hundred percent sustainably produced so yeah. i just wanted to, to to read the statement we're committed to manufacturing a 100 percent sustainable game using recycled and fsc certified materials along with the promise of no plastic and components and then you talk about manufacturer hero time is the leading board game producer in sustainability and the only manufacturer with the with the capability to produce 100% sustainable board games without sacrificing quality. And then you do say we're, you, that you're looking into alternative means to tr transporting the game from factories, like using trains, which are more eco-friendly. However, these methods prove not to be viable, but we're offsetting all of our freight shipping emissions using Tree Sisters. So from what I'm gathering, uh, the, the most important part of, of your eco friendliness in your game is to reduce the plastic, but it's not actually a hundred percent sustainably, sustainably produced then. Which uh, it's a hundred percent sustainably produced. It just isn't hundred percent sustainably shipped. So okay. the production of it is a hundred percent sustainable, even down to such as the uh, dyes that go into it, the inks that are used, everything okay, is. Okay, so the, the product that a um, consumer would receive yep. would be coming from recycled materials, yep. but also be recyclable, a hundred percent recyclable after that game is no longer valued by gamers and, you know, it would meet its end of life in the landfill. It That's would just it. decompose it on its own. That's this it. is awesome. We've been making plastics only since the 60s, and yet we've created so much in such a short amount of time that we have literally flooded our entire planet with it to the point where there are microplastics even at the very bottom of the ocean and in the soil at the other side of the world. It's one thing to have an issue with, um, you know, I, I want my game to be 100% sustainable to the point of even, you know, even the game arrived at me with no impact upon the world whatsoever. And yeah. I'll be honest, we don't have that many carrier pigeons. Since nobody really wants to wait probably two or three years for their game to get from China to America, I think, I think we're going to have to continue using ships for the time being. So is the cardboard a hundred percent recyclable. Yep. Yeah. I mean, the whole, all of it is made from recycled components. So, so oh, FSC wow. certification is, um, is basically where the forests have been grown specifically for consumption and will be regrown afterwards. There are no, um, you know, there are no new trees that have been chopped down that haven't like you know, basically no forests are deforested. No, uh, habitats are, destroyed there is no actual um there's no active degradation caused by the use of that wood so therefore it is considered sustainable the cardboard is i think the vast majority of it is uh recycled cardboard okay. any cardboard that isn't for i think i think there is some of it because oh, i think the box can't be recycled on the basis that it's needs to have a certain level of uh, solidity so it doesn't crumple. Um, that is, again, made from FSC certified um, uh, cardboard. Wood, yeah. wood or material. Wood. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So it's all, uh, it, all of the production will have no effect upon our planet. Um, and ultimately, that's the thing that we have the most control over. Even if we were promised that, say, um, you know, a ship or something like that was going to run on more eco-friendly oil or something along those lines. Ultimately, we can't guarantee it, but we can guarantee the state of our game. We can guarantee what our uh, game is made of and how it's made. So since that's what we can affect the most, as far as I can see, that's our best option to root for. All right. So I did want to just really dig into the 
terminology and saying that something is 100% sustainably produced is different than something being 100% sustainable. Are you concerned though that it might be a little misleading because that those terms are so close that maybe it would uh, make people feel, even though you don't mean to mislead them, and you do have a very good uh, point to the choices you made in your wording, um, is that a little bit of a risk though that people might say, oh, you know, eco-friendly stuff is all a scam or, or have some negative effect from that term? I mean, I'm not sure why anyone would say it's a scam because ultimately anyone who thinks that sustainability is something that we can always improve means that any action towards that goal is a positive step. Um, but I think the most important question to ask here is what is sustainability? How do you define whether or not something is sustainable? Um, you know, we as human beings are, are people who breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is CO2. Are we therefore unsustainable? Are we therefore contributing to the collapse of our planet just by breathing? The answer is not really, because the amount that we create is so small that the planet's forces, the natural means that it's able to renew itself and create new life and, and sequester carbon and all the rest of it is negligible in comparison to the planetary forces. The problem is that our society has become so powerful that our effect is not negligible anymore. We are causing an immense amount of damage and we're doing it more so every year and we need to turn that back. If I only have control over how um, our board game is produced, then that is going to be produced within a way that has zero effect. And if something has 0% effect upon our planet in its existence, then as far as I'm concerned, that effectively means it's 100% sustainably produced. It doesn't break down into anything that causes any uh, environmental issues and that boundary point where we stop affecting our planet in a way that damages it and start making things within what it's able to sustain that's what sustainability is so as far as I can see as far as I'm aware Hero Time is able to manufacture our games in a way that has no planetary impact within that production method that makes it 100% sustainable it's entirely possible that sustainability will get better in time, but it's still within that margin. Hmm. So as far as I'm aware, we're not misleading anyone. It is accurate. We are making a 100% sustainably produced board game. Okay. Although you're not um, taking into the equation, the shipping, uh, and maybe even like the natural energy that the manufacturer is using at its site. Um, in regards to the energy that he's using, I think that's something you might want to talk to Herschel about. He is, after all, the one that runs the company. Um, and and I, I could probably put you in touch and you can, you can get that chatting. That would be great. Yeah, yeah, um, I would. So, so you don't know to that extent, like if they're using solar energy or if they're using anything to offset their emissions. I'll be honest, it's been about six months since I've spoken to Herschel and got our quote and talked to him about all this stuff and I've completely forgotten. He may well be. Fair uh, enough, fair enough. I, I, can, I can do my best to, to get to the bottom of that. That's, I'm also, that's I'm also happy to drop him an email and directly ask and you can release that with your episode if you want. Sure. I'm more than happy for that too. Okay. With regard to shipping, we we are doing our absolute best to make sure it has as little impact as possible. The shipping industry is one of the dirtiest in the world and there's no getting around that. It is a awful industry filled with corruption. It's incredibly, they use the worst possible oils to power their vehicles because they're the cheapest. It's the more you learn, the worse it gets. Mm, um, yeah. and, and trust me, if there was any way that I could not be a part of that, and, and still be capable of, of you know, this company being afloat, I would do. And that's why we're looking yeah. at trains. We're looking at trains because that's a way to be able to send stuff out of China, across Russia, through into Europe. And then from there, it would be shipped across the Atlantic into, or possibly air freighted, though I'm not sure which would be better, um, in order to get to America. However, e even trains are not 100%. You know, there's no, they use, uh, they use petrol to start them up and then normally it's electric powered from there. 
the but the trouble is there's only so many lines and so there's only so many trains and so as a result there's only so much room which makes it much more expensive gotcha. um, mm -hmm. if we're able to make enough sales that we're able to afford that we will 100 percent go for it i mm. i very much up for that um unfortunately we can't guarantee it so as a result i can't guarantee it gotcha. um even in a worst case scenario regardless of what method we take we will be offsetting all of our freight emissions via tree sisters again i can't find out what exact fuel a particular ship is using so i'm mm -hmm. not going to be able to get an absolute definite amount of uh of of emissions that our ship is going to be giving off I or see. our train okay. is going to be giving off and anyone who says that they can i would love to know how they're doing it please <laughs> but ultimately we will be trying to nail down the as close to as we can what the estimated amount is and then mm -hmm. we'll be off offsetting it using tree sisters and tree sisters is a very highly renowned and well uh i guess documented um mm -hmm. producer of not only carbon offsetting but also they put their money into things that increase female empowerment oh okay so which in turn is one of the major drives of creating a sustainable future is creating equality among all people more equality equals a better sustainable world so I see. it's creating good impact on two fronts right well i yeah i appreciate that you're you're you know making up for what is lacking in the um in the shipping and i know that is a huge hurdle for people everywhere i think the only true solution for that is to manufacture locally and distribute locally but that is a very idealized situation you need to be in it we, we did actually look at, at local manufacturer um and the truth is that uh the uk is it's just it doesn't have the infrastructure to be able to manufacture games on using boards or pieces or things like that if you want a deck of cards they can do that at a relatively average quality um okay. if you want more than that it's it's you're going to be paying three times the price for half the quality it's going to do more harm than good to the eco cause because ultimately people go oh well you made an eco-friendly game which actually now that i think about it none of the uk manufacturers had any eco credentials whatsoever so the, mm. on top of it they weren't even sustainable yeah. so even except for the distribution and, and the carbon footprint of shipping and stuff that's it it, it, it doesn't actually offer uh the eco-friendly options as far as the product is that no. the difference there i see and and on top of that the second biggest argument against eco games that i hear all the time is well if it's made in an eco-friendly manner then it, the quality won't be as good Mm -hmm. which if we're going if we're going to make a game eco-friendly but it's low quality all we're going to do is strengthen that argument and make less people want to make eco-friendly games okay. so with all of these things with the offsetting the shipping with the using trains with the making it 100 percent manufacturing um in terms of sustainable um with all these things we're trying to do the most good we can mm -hmm. We're trying to maximize how much good we can do both for the board game industry and for our planet it's it's not a hundred percent impactless but the one bit that we do have control over which is the manufacturing is and we're mm. proud of that i know that shrink wrap is a another huge hurdle right up there with shipping how are you handling shrink wrap are you a shrink are you gonna have to use it or are you looking at other options for that so Hero Time does actually give a completely plastic free shrink wrapping option. Uh, however, it's completely at odds with distributors. So um, basically so what is that it means. Paper is, or, or yeah. what it, oh okay. So basically we've got one option which is the which is the paper. So it's effectively uh, you know it, it's able to be wrapped, it'll look nice, it'll be pretty, but it is won't. Is it like be. a brown paper that's just plain, like packaging paper or I, I just oh. have no idea what to expect. Like, what would that be like? I'm fairly sure you're able to have designs and such printed on them. Oh, cool. But, yeah. Uh, I think it's nonetheless, you know, it's a wrapping and so you can't see through it. 
Mm -hmm. And what that means is that distributors and such go, well, I, I can't see through it, which means that no one has a guarantee of what they're getting on the inside because you can't see through it. Um, and that what that ends up being is that you either can only sell to a few distributors, which means the game becomes very difficult to get to people around the world on an on a actual board gamer to board gamer basis. Um, you know, if you have someone in a shop, you have a shopkeeper who is putting their board game on the thing, do they take the paper off? So yeah, do they have a box that you're able to open up and hypothetically someone could have messed with the insides or whatever else, or do they have it wrapped in paper, which appears, you know, you, you don't have a guarantee what's inside. I, I realize that there is a uh, practicality with the shrink wrap. I know a lot of people say it keeps moisture out, so it's going to preserve the game until it gets to the consumer's house, which is super important. That's but true. I feel like aesthetically, if you're able to actually print some of the artwork from the game, would that really be that terrible? As, no, as far as a would, consumer, I'm like, oh, it's wrapped. It's gift wrapped. Yeah. Like a box of chocolate yeah. or something. <laughs> what we're hoping to do, because basically the other option other than shrink wrap, uh, sorry, other than paper, Right. is to be able to uh, wrap it in recycled plastic, oh, which okay. means that it won't be creating any new plastic and so therefore won't be having any impact per se. But we really don't want plastic on our game. We really don't want plastic involved in it. We want to avoid that wherever as possible. So yes, we do want to use the paper option if we can. Um, and we're talking to distributors even now. We're trying to find out if there's a way in which we can do it that would enable them to take it. Hmm. Um, but of course, as with any industry that deals with huge quantities of people all the time, anything that is different and that they have to make an exception for, they're very hesitant to do. Um, yes. Nonetheless, nonetheless, one of the things we're really hoping to do is we're hoping to do a stretch goal mm -hmm. where basically if we can reach a thousand backers, which is our minimum quantity order, we will be able to put that order aside mm -hmm. and be able to use our own money to get the additional order uh, for distributors that can be done in recycled plastic, but the one for our Kickstarter backers that can be for done in paper because you yeah. know what you're getting. You, there's no selling issues here. You guys can, can get your game in, in all wrapped up in paper, as you say, like a little gift and it will be great. And it will mean that it'll be just that little bit more uh, eco-friendly, yeah. just a little bit yeah. more. And so we want that. Yeah. But we can't do that unless we get enough backers to be able to afford it. I see. Okay. So, yeah, there's our barrier. When is your Kickstarter actually scheduled to launch? We are launching on the 24th of August. And awesome. it is, yeah, we're really excited. We're going to be, uh, we've got a whole bunch of events that are going to be planned throughout it. Um, and it's going to be going on a little bit longer than the normal sort of Kickstarter length of 30 days. We're doing an additional week mm -hmm. because one week later, uh, we're going to be having a really big, well, we're, we're still kind of working on it, but to tease it a little bit, we're thinking it's going to be a celebrity playthrough. Oh, um, cool. Yes. So not, not any, no, no more details than that, but just that little teaser. So fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> so where can people stay up to date with what's going on with, um, your company with earth rising where's a good place to check out all the latest information yeah uh we have quite a good few yeah. places the best place for ongoing information as it as it stands as it develops mm -hmm. would be to come and join our mailing list which you can jump on our website um we update monthly and uh we always let everyone know what we've been doing, how we've been doing it. And also we give a little bit of extra eco positive news that happens throughout the world to give everyone that little bit of positive boost about it all. Um, and then if you want to talk to us in person, come by our discord channel. Mm. Uh, we are always on it because we basically use it to, well, we orchestrate all our company through it. So we're always on it and there and answering questions. So drop by, talk to us, say hi, um, let us know what you are looking forward to or worried about, and we will happily talk to you. Um, awesome. Also, we host games there, so you can literally come and play a game of Earth Rising with us. Um, oh, that's great. I just wanted to kind of finish our conversation with this last question. Um, and I'm not even sure how to word it, but I'm just curious if you've found 
an ally or a source of encouragement in this endeavor to be more eco-friendly that kind of surprised you? Ah, um, <laughs> the trouble is we've been in contact with so many people. Yeah, uh, you don't want to like, leave people out. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's it, right? Not only do you not want to leave people out, but also who who surprised us more? I think I think the biggest surprise for us um, was when I said earlier about how my inspiration was the 2040 documentary. Um, and the first thing we did when we had a working prototype online was we sent a message out to Kate Rayworth, who did the donor economic system. Um, and she actually replied and we actually had a play test with her and she gave us a whole bunch of advice on how the game like could be better and uh, and she was immensely impressed with what we had already and all this sort of stuff so it was awesome sort of seeing these people on this documentary and being like oh wait now i'm in a call with them actually playing this board game i designed this is insane That's so that was fantastic it was amazing um and then also she then put us in contact with damon who did the 2040 documentary and we then ended up playing a game of it with him <laughs> so that was also amazing and that is. awesome um so yeah they they loved it to bits and now are one of our partners on the game um which i, I just realized i didn't mention that 50 percent of all of the profits of earth rising are going to charities that are making sustainability happen in real life wow um we i've talked a bit about like how we need to be able to make it function as a company and so there are certain things that we can't afford to do or uh, aren't viable financially but just to make it really clear we're not looking to make a buck off the back of eco uh, eco sort of uh it's not a scam as you were saying right, before right. you know we're yeah. even when we make money we're going to take half of it and mm. spread it throughout these organizations that are making it happen in real life mm. which also means that anyone who buys a copy of earth rising whilst it's not a direct donation, they can know that part of what they're putting into this game is going to be going into the real world and is going to be making our world better as a result. We, we want this game not to just be a game. We want it to be a piece of history where people look back and go, hey, it's a good thing all this happened because, you know, like yeah. it was bad, but just, just like as we managed to transform it in Earth Rising, we've managed to transform it in the real world too. That's what we want. Yeah. And we're doing everything we possibly can to make that happen. Um, That's awesome. So, yeah. Well, Lori, I wanted to thank you so much for your transparency and your openness to having this conversation, for your passion for the environment and for the world to have a better future. I just so glad there's designers out there like you. So thank you. And um I just love what you say when you when you ask yourself the question, where can we do the most good? Because I resonate with that so much. Um, we sometimes feel very overwhelmed and helpless with the state of the way things are. And there's a lot of discouragement out there. But to know that there are people just looking to do the most good that they can is so wonderful. So thank you for that. And I hope everyone has a chance to check out Earth Rising. It's definitely something to look into. And I hope I get a chance to play this. I'll have to check out your Discord and jump on there with you guys sometime definitely. soon. Definitely. Oh, that'll be great. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again. And I hope you guys, I hope you have an awesome day. And everyone watching, I hope you have an awesome day as well. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye. If you are interested in checking out Earth Rising, it will be coming out on Kickstarter August 24th, and I will link that below in the description. Seeing themes about climate change is a really cool idea, and seeing more recyclable materials and less plastic in our board games are also the right direction to go in. So I'm very excited about the work that the Stop, Drop, and Roll team is doing with their board games. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Across the Board. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something, and I will see you in the next one.